Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 8. We will be reading it in two different translations. So Liz will read from one translation and I will read from another. We will go verse by verse with these translations. It is Psalm 8. It is found on page 492 in the Bibles in the pew. Let us listen for God's word. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. God, brilliant Lord, yours is a household name. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. Nursing infants gurgle choruses about you. Toddlers shout the songs that drown out enemy talk and silence atheist babble. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Look up at your macro skies, dark and enormous, your handmade sky, sky jewelry, moon and stars mounted in their settings. Then I look at my micro self and wonder, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands you have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Yet we've so narrowly missed being gods, bright with Eden's dawn light. You put us in charge of your handicrafted world, rep repeated to us your Genesis charge, made us lords of sheep and cattle, even animals out in the wild, birds flying and fish swimming, whales singing in the ocean deeps. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God, brilliant Lord, your name echoes around the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord God, open my mouth that I may proclaim your praise. Silence in us any voice but your voice, so that in hearing we may be obedient to your will. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Under the category heading of biting off more than we can chew, today we consider the very big question, who is God? In science, the big question is the Big Bang Theory and the origins of the universe. In sociology, the big question is, why do men not stop and ask for directions? In Scotland, the big question is, what do they wear under those kilts? But for large-minded and faithful people, it all boils down to this very big question. Who is God? What better day to ask this question than on the day when we celebrate the Trinity? Because the Trinity was Christianity's first attempt to describe God in a somewhat reasonable and logical manner. The Christian councils that developed the Trinity many, many years ago argued and they argued and they argued for many years and then they finally came up with a compromise and they said, we think we know who God is. God is the Father, 
and God is the Son, and God is the Holy Ghost. And then they packed up their bags, and they went home. Arriva derci, sayonara, auf Wiedersehen, case closed. And the case was closed for about five minutes. And then speculation about God began again, and disputes became arguments, and arguments became fighting words, and then people were excommunicated, and some were burned at the stake, and a beautiful and poetic question became a politicized and demonized power struggle. Because if you knew the answer to that big question, then you could maybe rule the world. At the very least, you could have a lot of people under your thumb. Well, as much as I find the idea of ruling the world quite satisfying, what I find more satisfying and frankly more interesting is getting back to that original question, the original big question, who is God? Because there is something extremely beautiful and extremely poetic about that question. When we ask this question, we are seeking to know the intimate details of this being who created all that is. We're not satisfied with the simple answer of God is this or God is that. It's not, that's not big enough. Now we need to know more. We need an answer that fills all of our senses and, and fills all the skies and fills in all the nooks and crannies of the world. We need an answer that is given through the music and the arts and drama and literature. We need an answer that takes seriously our culture and the culture of the Muslims, and the culture of the Hindus, and on and on, take seriously every culture who has ever considered God. For don't you think, honestly, that God is more than the Trinity? As much as I love the idea of the Trinity, I realize that it is a human invention, never even mentioned in the Bible. And it begins to answer the question about God, but I think most of us know it only scrapes the surface. Because I think we know that God is bigger than our biggest thoughts and higher than our highest dreams and broader than our broadest imagination. And to me, that is beautiful. And that is poetic. And that is a God who I want to worship. Now, reading Psalm 8 today from two different translations begins to get at this idea. From the Bibles in our pews, the NRSV, verse 1 is this. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This translation gives us a tremendous sense of the might and glory of God. The Lord's name reigns in all the earth, and it establishes a global and even universal reach. It's beautiful, it's poetic. Compare this verse to verse 1 in the translation that Liz read, a translation called The Message. It goes like this, God Brilliant Lord, yours is a household name. Well, again, we get a large-scale sense of our wise and wonderful God. Brilliant, says the translation. But there's also a closeness here with God, an intimacy here with God, so that God's name is known in all the households. At 66 North Sheridan, and 815 Wallace and 5650 Wood Hollow Drive. God is a household name. So, the question, who is God? Well, 
it depends on who you are and where you live. It's the same idea if someone should ask the question, who is Bob Hymack? If the question comes to Jenny, she says something like, he is my husband, he is wildly handsome, amazingly athletic, and on and on, pretty good at balancing the checkbook. On the other hand, he keeps a messy desk and he refuses to clean the shower. Well, that's fair enough. But what if the same question goes to Liz? Who is Bob Hymack? She might say something like, he is the senior pastor, he wears the same shirt every day, he drinks a lot of coffee, he's fairly organized, somewhat pleasant, but wow, is he controlling. <laughs> so there is some truth to both of these statements, and a lot of exaggeration, but it has to be that way, you see, because their perspectives are different. They see me from different angles and in different roles, so there is zero chance that they would say the same thing about me. And these are people who see me almost every day, and yet their descriptions would be so different. Ask Jean Ann, or ask Craig, or ask Mo, or ask my mom. Each of them would say something different about me. My mother, of course, would rave about me. So please, ask my mom. <laughs> well, if we cannot fully describe someone who is standing directly in front of us, then why should it be surprising to us that we get different answers to the question, who is God? It shouldn't be surprising at all. In fact, it should be exciting. It should be thrilling. It should be mind-blowing. Because with each different perspective, we get a little closer and closer to the truth. One translation says, O oh Lord, our sovereign. And the other translation says, God, brilliant Lord. I like them both. I, little mo I learn a little more about God from each of them. Now, one thing we can all agree on, I think, is that we learn most about God from what God does. So the Trinity, then, becomes kind of God's job description. God the Father is the creator and the maker of all. God the Son is the Savior and the Redeemer. God the Holy Spirit is the ongoing sustainer of life, nourishing our imagination and our creativity and leading us in the baptism of Jude William, the love child. So then, we may not be on the same page as to who God is, but we can come to some agreement on what God does. God creates, God saves, God sustains us, and the reason that God does all of this is because of the number one thing about God, the thing above everything about God, is that God loves. In the opening hymn, we sang that song that everybody knows, they will know we are Christians by our love. Well, the same about God. We will know who God is by God's love. So who is God? Well, God is not the one who brings tragedy and war and pain and suffering. There's nothing loving about that. God is not the one who encourages arrogance and injustice and intolerance. There's nothing loving about that. God is not the one 
who pollutes the world or who turns people against one another. Again, that is not love. So none of that comes from God. That's not who God is. But we get closer and closer to understanding who God is when we participate or witness acts of love. Last Sunday afternoon, in our condo building, we had a little memorial service to, for a resident who had died. It was not a particularly popular person in our building. In fact, nobody really liked him very much. He was a bit peculiar. Sometimes he was downright nasty. And I'm embarrassed to admit that I would go out of my way to, annoy, to avoid him it's true if he was at the mailboxes or if he's standing at the elevator waiting and I'd go around someplace else I'd avoid him so of course they asked me to lead the memorial service <laughs> but in the service I think all of us who were there thought it very important to acknowledge him as a child of God and to give thanks for his life. We didn't have to agree with him and we didn't even have to like him. But for those of us who attended, I think we all realize that we did need to love him because God loved him. That's one of the big differences between God and us. God doesn't wait for someone to die in order to love that person. God's love is from beginning to end. If you write a psalm, you tend to describe God in poetry. If you compose music, you tend to describe God with rhythm and notes. If you wait tables at a restaurant, you may describe God in terms of the generosity of tips. If you plant a vegetable garden, you may describe God as the master gardener of Eden. All of these descriptions and so many more are accurate, but none of them alone are really complete. And so, it is our job as people of faith to continue writing this poetry, composing this music, gathering those tips, growing those gardens, so that we never stop growing closer and closer to God. So, finally, the time has come. Who is this God? I need a drum roll, please. No, seriously, I need a drum roll. All right, enough. Who is God? The answer is, it is for God to know and for you to discover. And so in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, how majestic is God's name in all the earth.